I, you know, I can't answer that. I don't know, what kind of question is that? Hi friends, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Legia, I'm a real life lawyer on a mission to demystify the law and how it affects your everyday life. Today, we're doing a fun thing that I've seen other people do on YouTube, but I've never seen a lawyer do, and that is react to commonly Googled lawyer questions. Can you tell how dirty these glasses are? Because, <laughs> I can. So I got my handy dandy little iPad here and I'm just gonna open a incognito window on Google and see what the heck pops up. What are you guys searching for? What are you curious about? The Googs always knows. So let's check it out. Speaking of being curious and searching out new information, let's talk about the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Thank you so much to Skillshare for partnering with me today. I wanna to tell you all about them. I really enjoy Skillshare because there's literally every skill under the sun that you could learn on that platform. And for me as a creative and an entrepreneur, there is a wealth of knowledge to be found on Skillshare and I can't stop watching. I can't stop taking these classes. What's cool is that as professionals, people with experience in whatever industry you're interested in, teaching you their skills, sharing their skills with you, if you will, Skillshare. The name says it all. I use Skillshare as a means of growing my creativity and my skills in the various creative and entrepreneurial things that I enjoy doing. I've taken video editing classes. I've taken lighting and photography classes. Right now I'm taking a class from Lily Singh, who's a well-known YouTuber, storyteller, author, et cetera, et cetera, where she's talking about storytelling through YouTube videos. I'm super proud of the things I've created here on YouTube, but there's so much more for me to learn and to grow in. And by taking classes like the one that Lily Singh has on the Skillshare platform, I'm able to grow in my skills and expand what I can bring to you here on YouTube. But even if you're not a YouTuber, there's so many other things. There's music, there's art, there's creativity, there's business development. There's so many things to learn on Skillshare. I genuinely think it's a really great accessible resource. And you know, if you've been following me, that I'm all about accessibility to education and to learning opportunities. And Skillshare really brings it to the people. So invest in yourself and in your own personal growth by checking out Skillshare today. What's exciting is that Skillshare is actually offering my viewers a special deal. The first 1,000 of you that click the link in the description down below will get a full month of Skillshare for free. So you can get started on your personal growth journeys. Happy 2022, you know? So thank you so much to Skillshare for partnering with me on today's video. Let's get to Googling. Shall we? I'm gonna go ahead and go to google.com. Not sure if you've ever heard of it. Do lawyers. Do lawyers make good money? Some of us, some don't. Depends on what area of law you go into and where in the country you go into it. If you're starting a nonprofit law here in the Midwest, 50 to 60 grand a year is probably a solid average where you could start at. If you're starting at private law in a big East Coast firm, you could be starting at $205,000 a year, right out the gate from law school. And if you're in a government position, it's usually somewhere in the middle. So it's a big range. You can certainly up your earning potential by getting a JD, but it does not guarantee that you're gonna be making six figures, for example. Do lawyers work on weekends? Sometimes, not me. I'm my own boss, so I've just implemented a company-wide four-day work week policy. But when I was in private law, yes, yes, I did work on weekends. And sometimes even now I do, but luckily I like what I do, so it doesn't really even feel necessarily like work. I would say on average in like a private law setting, here in the Midwest at least, it's a little different on the coast where things are a little bit more intense. I would say on average here, you're working maybe one or two weekends every month. Do lawyers wear wigs in England? Some of them do. I think the, the Barristers, the ones who are actually litigating, I think they do. And I'm sorry to say it's not the case in the in the US. Maybe I would have stuck with litigation if it was. Do lawyers lie? <laughs> some of them. Yes, some of them do. Do lawyers take credit cards? Uh, some of them. I feel like every question is gonna be, well, it depends. So this is getting at retainers. A lot of lawyers require retainers for their clients. What a retainer is, is they say, you have to pay me X amount of money up front, say $20,000, and I'm gonna keep that in an account for you. It's not spent, I'm just holding on to it for you so that I know you're good for it. And then as I do work for you, I will take from it, but I will only take what I've actually earned and I'll send you a bill every month to let you know. Once that retainer amount gets low, I'll ask you to replenish the retainer with another 20K or whatever. Some lawyers don't have a retainer level that high, but you know what I mean. But there is kind of a growing trend and a more modern trend that a lot of lawyers are doing where they are offering kind of package deals for not necessarily litigation type things, but for transactional work like contract drafting or things that are kind of have a 
a base cost where they offer just a package deal where like I'll draft this for you and you pay me X amount of money. In that case, they might accept credit cards. It depends. And then there's also a contingency fee type arrangement, which is where a lawyer agrees to work for you and you don't actually have to pay them until you win a certain amount in court. So once you win in court, you do have to pay them a certain percentage, usually anywhere between 20 and 40% of your winnings. Do lawyers have lawyers? Oh yes, they do. <laughs> Many of them need them. Also, a lot of lawyers have insurance because there's the ever looming threat of being sued for malpractice. And in that case, yes, you for sure need a lawyer. Also, it's a common misconception that if you're a lawyer, you know everything about the law. That simply is not true. Let me say it again for people in my DMs asking for legal advice. That is not true. Lawyers don't know everything about the law. Lawyers have specialized areas of knowledge. So if I was sued for like securities fraud, I would definitely need a lawyer to come help me out. All right. Do lawyers work on holidays? Some of them do, yes. Not me, not this one, not interested. Life's too short, my friends. Can lawyers, can lawyers have tattoos? <laughs> Funny you should ask. Check out my tattoo video from a couple weeks ago. <coughs> short answer, yes, they can. Can lawyers smoke weed? I would assume theoretically, if it is legal in the state where you reside and you are a lawyer there, then I think yes, you could because you're not breaking the law. Can lawyers serve on juries? Yes, they can. They would probably be heavily scrutinized to make sure they don't have any biases, but yeah, they can serve on juries. I haven't yet, and I would very much like to. Can lawyers get in trouble for lying? Yes, they can. Lawyers are governed by the rules of ethics of whatever jurisdiction where they practice, and probably in 100% of states, ethics rules require lawyers to be honest. If there is any previous charges of dishonesty, like in fraud, for example, that is looked on very unfavorably when you're trying to become a lawyer. Can lawyers have piercings? Um, I was gonna say yes, they can. Yes, obviously I do. I took my nose ring out when I worked in private practice and before judges, I always take my nose ring out because my main concern, and I said this in my tattoo video a few weeks ago, is whether or not I'm going to prejudice my client in the eyes of a judge. There are some old school judges. I don't wanna risk it. So because I'm concerned about the judge perceiving me and reading into me, as a reflection of my client, I'll take out my nose ring in front of a judge. Again, when I was in private practice, I took out my nose ring, but for the most part, it doesn't matter. And I've seen lawyers with nose rings in front of judges as well. So it is a, a kind of changing, evolving thing. Can lawyers lie in court? No. <laughs> No, they cannot. Do they? Maybe, but they're not supposed to. How do lawyers, how do lawyers dress? Well, <laughs> my goodness, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Listen, lawyers dress however they want. A lot of lawyers have a lot of opinions on how lawyers should dress, but in the end you get to dress however you want. I will say if you're going to an interview, you're gonna wanna wear a suit because you're gonna wanna get the job. When you're in court, wear a suit. Again, here it's all about your client. What is the judge going to look favorably upon? You wearing a suit. But while you're working, if you're in private law, some law firms still require you to wear sleeves in a suit, but there are a lot of law firms that are kind of updating their requirements. And now they have kind of dress for your day arrangements, which is like, what are you doing today? If you're meeting with a client, maybe dress up. If you're going to court, put on a suit. But if not, wear some jeans, it doesn't matter. You're an adult, you get to figure that out for yourself. And from there, I've talked about this before, but I do have kind of a lot of um, opinions of being a person with an hourglass figure trying to dress for a job that is traditionally male dominated and suit dominated in a way that doesn't necessarily flatter what I'm bringing to the table. Okay, obviously I love a good suit jacket. Like who doesn't love a good blazer? But from there it gets complicated and I have yet to master the art, frankly. How do lawyers know when someone dies? Um, you know, I can't answer that. <laughs> I would assume the same way anyone else does. How do lawyers use math? <laughs> We don't. It's a running joke that lawyers make that they didn't go to law school to do math. Now there are some lawyers that specialize in damages, like they specialize in figuring out and calculating how much damages are owed to someone, which is complex because sometimes damages have to do with like pain and suffering or other intangible things. So there are lawyers who do math. The vast majority don't though. How do lawyers decide to take a case? Um, that's a complicated question. And I think it depends on a lot of things. It's gonna depend on whether or not there's any sort of conflict of interest. Like maybe you've worked for the opposing party before. If a client comes to you and says, I'm getting sued, but you've worked for the person that sued them, you can't take that case. Or you have a personal relationship in a way that might affect your ability to provide zealous and unbiased representation for your client, then maybe you shouldn't take the case. Or if you have a client load, that means that you don't have the time to really put towards this new client, probably shouldn't take the case. Or if it's in an area of law you don't really have any experience in, sometimes you can take the case and learn as you go. But usually ethics 
ethics require that you don't charge the client for the things as you're learning them, but only for the actual work you're doing for the client. But for the most part, you know, lawyers aren't taking on cases in areas of law that they have absolutely no experience in. There's also a question of difficult clients, which is a huge thing that lawyers have to deal with. Some clients can be really difficult. They're not cooperative. They're not communicative. They don't take the lawyer's advice. Things like that have to also come into consideration when determining whether or not to take on a client. And then there's also the issue of money. Can this client even pay you for your services? If you're in private practice, that comes into play. However, if you're like a government attorney, you're either going to be a public defender wherein you're assigned cases, I think, I don't know, I've never worked in a public defender's office, or you are a prosecutor and you work for the government so you don't have clients or the government is your client. How do lawyers sign their name? Same as everyone else. With a pen? I don't know. How do you sign your name? What kind of question is that? What do lawyers do? <laughs> Great question. Lawyers do a lot of things, and there seems to be a lot of misconceptions about this. There are some lawyers who litigate. They are called litigators. They can work for the government, they can work for private practice, or they can work for nonprofits. Those people represent a party in court before a judge. They do the typical thing that you envision a lawyer doing. They show up in court, they argue in favor of their client, they file motions, they deal with discovery, they handle the documents and the depositions, they do the things that you think that a lawyer does, okay? But then there are a lot of lawyers that don't do that. There are a lot of lawyers that work in transactional law, meaning they draft contracts or they give advice like business advice or intellectual property advice or things like that. There are also a number of lawyers who do work that is not technically the practice of law, but a JD helps. So they could work in other various aspects of government, working on policy or other nonprofits doing that type of similar work. There are also lawyers that work for judges, for the judiciary, helping judges draft their opinions. There are also lawyers that work for the legislature, helping legislators know what the law says. Lawyers do all sorts of things, not just what you see on TV. What do lawyers major in? Anything you want. In fact, it's a strength to you if you've majored in something that isn't traditional. I majored in political science. That is a very common thing that lawyers will do. I didn't even do it thinking I would necessarily go into law. I just was genuinely interested in politics. But a lot of people also major in history before going into law. But if you have a specific interest in something, it actually really helps you to have had background experience in it before going to law school. So if you want to work work in fashion law, for example, having a fashion degree like Elle Woods, for example, could be a strength. Or if you have a background in like biology or STEM of some sort, using that and then going into like patent law, for example, will set you apart from your competition. So you can major in whatever you want. What do lawyers do all day? <laughs> That's a valid question. Listen, again, it's going to depend based on what type of law that you do. I can speak from my experience in private practice, especially when you're starting out as a lawyer, a new lawyer, you're going to be doing a lot of researching. You're going to be doing a lot of drafting documents for lawyers who are more important than you. That could be drafting letters to clients. That could be drafting cease and desist letters to other people. That could be drafting motions, briefs, other types of court documents. They'll be the initial draft that then a lawyer more important than you will revise and edit. You're also then going to be doing a lot of legal research. So like looking for cases that support your argument, writing out what your findings are and presenting them to a partner or or a more senior attorney to help them craft their legal arguments. This is all litigation. I don't know what people do in like the business law area, the transactional stuff. I don't know. I think it's also a lot of drafting. Deal making, I hear, is a thing they do. And then as you get more senior, you start doing things like taking depositions. You get to be the one actually drafting things and you get to start meeting one-on-one -on -one with clients more often. But again, that's in like large private law firm practice. If you are going more the nonprofit route, a lot of the times they throw you a caseload right away. So you're in court a lot and you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with clients a lot. So again, it really depends. But it's a lot of reading and it's a lot of writing. Why do lawyers? Why do lawyers use Esquire? I don't know. It's just like a term of uh, respect for people who are lawyers. So the word Esquire originally meant a knight's shield bearer who would probably himself eventually become a knight. It's literally a term from the Middle Ages. That's in any indication of where the legal practice is. Okay, but according to Black's Law Dictionary, the title Esquire signified the status of a man who was below a knight, but above a gentleman. There you go. Lawyers, not quite a knight, not quite a gentleman. Why do lawyers drag out cases? <laughs> Listen, for the most part, the entire legal system is 
dragging out cases. It's not usually the lawyer's call, but it can be a strategy in a case that some lawyers do where they'll just kind of like be really petty and make the case draw out knowing that the other party is gonna run out of money eventually or lose steam or lose interest and eventually give up. That is a strategy that some lawyers employ. But for the most part, like everything about the court system is backed up, especially with COVID and everything about legal cases takes forever because there is so much red tape and logistics and procedure that has to be followed. Why do lawyers charge so much? <laughs> well, I mean, you've got years and years of very specialized experience, plus lawyers know that you need them. Who else are you gonna go to? I'm not saying that's right, I'm saying that's what it is. That's part of the reason why I have such a conniption about how much we hoard legal knowledge is because lawyers can then charge a premium for that knowledge when it's not rocket science, okay? Why do lawyers do pro bono work? Probably because we like that warm, fuzzy feeling of helping someone. Also, for me at least, it does come with the idea that lawyers do charge a lot and that the legal field and legal representation is really inaccessible. So it's an access to justice thing. And you can get fancy awards if you do enough pro bono work, you get like recognized for it. And it's part of the corporate social responsibility for private law firms now to be able to list that at least 3% of the working hours that their lawyers do is dedicated to pro bono service, kind of like virtue signaling amongst the legal profession. But there is genuinely good work that lawyers do pro bono that is really important because a lot of nonprofits don't have the funds to actually pay lawyers. So private attorneys who are making a ton of money and have a few extra hours that they give to pro bono work is important. Why do lawyers make so much? <laughs> well, like I said, access to information. Who else are you gonna turn to so we can charge you whatever we want? Then there's also private practice, big law firms. Like I said, the starting salary for law firms on the East Coast right now is $205,000 a year. The reason they do that is because there's this competition for the best legal talent you can get. So the theory being, if you pay people a ton, you're going to attract the best legal minds to your firm. And so so there's this tradition of firms one-upping each other by slowly, incrementally increasing how much they pay their first year associates. So then all other law firms have to watch what they're doing and follow suit unless they wanna fall behind and not attract the best legal talent. So usually that translates to more pay for lawyers and higher expenses for clients. But then on the flip side, if you're working at a private firm like that and making $205,000 a year, you also usually have to make 2,200 billable hours a year, which equates to around like 50 hours a week of billable work, which is a lot because that means like the work that you're doing that you can charge a client for, which is not 100% of the work that you do as a lawyer. There's a lot of meetings, there's a lot of logistics, there's a lot of other things that you have to do to manage your law practice on top of actually doing billable work. So it necessitates 60, 70, 80 hour weeks in order to hit the number of hours that you're expected to hit to justify paying you that $205,000. This is a, a real conniption I always had with private law is that what if we just pay paid me less and I could work less so I could have a life and live comfortably. There is really kind of a, a missing niche there in the legal field where you could make like 80, 90, $100,000 a year and maybe work just like a solid nine to five, just like putting in the basic effort, making a solid living, but not making a grotesque amount of money in an exchange being expected to sell your soul or on the flip side, working in a nonprofit, making 50 or $60,000 a year. There is that happy medium sometimes in government work, but those jobs are pretty coveted as well. Why do lawyers hate their jobs? <laughs> well, this pretty much piggybacks off of what I was just saying. There is very little work-life balance, Usually, a lot of lawyers get into the legal profession not knowing what it actually entails, which is a lot of really boring, tedious work and a lot of writing and reading. I personally underestimated how fucking boring it was gonna be, which is one of the reasons why I left. And there's just so much pressure to be perfect at all times when you're practicing law, especially at big law firm jobs, that it's just crushing soul crushing, it's very unfulfilling. At least it was for me. But they say that government lawyers are some of the happiest lawyers because they do strike that balance between a good pay, good benefits, but not having unreasonable expectations of your time. But even government lawyers can get burnt out. It's just a lot of work and it's hard and it can be really tedious. Where do lawyers advertise? Well, 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 just about anywhere they can get their grimy little paws to. I'm just kidding. 
kind of. There are a lot of lawyers that do the kind of Better Call Saul type advertising where it's like middle of the day and they're like, were you injured in an auto accident? That's really common for smaller law firms, especially personal injury law firms, work compensation law firms, medical malpractice type things, things where they're seeking out clients who have been injured and they need to kind of ask around and get clients. Larger law firms, like the big private firm, like where I worked, a lot of it is word of mouth. They're not putting out advertising on billboards and stuff. For the most part, it's like, I met this person through this other person and they need legal representation. Or like, I met a representative of this big company and they have said that they need some representation, so I'm gonna pitch our firm to that company. So that can be a little bit more of like word of mouth and networking. But it is true that I would say generally, as a whole, the legal industry could really use some um, uh, professional graphic designers maybe some better marketing experts to swoop on in and help law firms out when it comes to their branding and marketing. Because there really is just like the one brown and maroon law firm aesthetic that they've all just adopted and accepted. <laughs> as their own. Truly nothing is off the table when it comes to lawyers advertising. Well, that's it, my friends. I hope that this was fun for you. Let me know if I missed any burning questions that you would like me to answer down below, or if you have any other video suggestions. Thank you once again to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. A reminder to check out the link down below. The first 1,000 viewers who click that link will get their first month of Skillshare for free. So enjoy. Reminder that I offer content creator sessions. If you're interested in becoming a content creator or a YouTuber, check out my website and schedule a session with me today. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day. Goodbye.